Arxan is now digital.ai. Join us at our booth in the virtual expo hall to learn how our app protection, white box cryptography, and threat analytics solutions can help you stay ahead of the evolving threat landscape. Welcome to the global OWASP AppSec uh, San Francisco 2020. My name is Amol Sarvade, and I'm head of security research at Cloud Passage. The title of today's session is Real-Time Vulnerability Alerting by Using Principles from the U.S. Tsunami Warning Center. But before we dive in, let me give you a brief background. So at Cloud Passage in security research, in addition to the usual product-based uh, cloud container and server-based research, what we were also looking at is we were uh, wanting to have a automated and real-time vulnerability alerting system that could alert us on the most prevalent, on the most high-priority vulnerabilities. So we decided to build this system ourselves. Initially, this was meant for internal use, and now we are trying to expose this system to the rest of the world, to the greater community. So this presentation is uh, a direct, uh, is in, is a direct offspring of uh, that project. So let's take a look at the brief agenda or the outline for the next few minutes. Uh, we'll introduce the and introduce. We'll start with some introductions and problem definition. We will go over our approach. We'll also touch on how we design the system. What are some of the tools we used? Uh, what are some of the platforms, languages, and tricks that we um, incorporated in making this system. In addition to that, we'll go over a host of example vulnerabilities that were selected by this uh, automated system. And we'll end with some future work and some of the enhancements and some of the new features uh, that, can, that, that need to be added and that we are in the process of adding to make uh, life better. So with that brief of outline, let's get started. So this, uh, this is a view of, uh, of a tsunami, but most of our ID professionals see this view every day. And instead of tsunami, what they see is a large group or a large amount of vulnerabilities coming towards them every day. It, it, it was the same problem for IT professional as well as our own internal researchers. And therefore we developed this system so that it could give our own internal researchers also uh, uh, some guidance on what vulnerabilities to focus on and what and how to prioritize them. So this chart that I have on the screen right now is the number of unique vulnerabilities out there. And this goes out from two decades from when NVD started documenting vulnerabilities to last year. If you see in the last three years, on an average, there have been about 15,000 unique vulnerabilities uh, that were listed. Now, these are unique vulnerabilities. You multiply them by the number of viruses, worms, uh, scripts, um, exploit packs, and you get a large amount of attacks based on the unique vulnerabilities. As you all know, like a single unique vulnerability is used by many types and many variants of viruses, worms, threat actors, so on and so forth. And multiply that by the amount of uh, heterogeneous machines that you may have in your organization. All in all, you have on an average, as this chart shows, 15,000, which is a very large number of unique vulnerabilities. So how is an IT professional or a team of security uh, IT professionals able to triage these vulnerabilities when you have maybe 40 to 50 new vulnerabilities coming every day and multiply that, as I mentioned, by the number of viruses, number of worms, and number of devices in your organization. So this chart, and as I mentioned, this uh, project was inspired by 
our tsunami tracking center, which is uh, NOAA, National Weather Service, uh, US Tsunami Warning Center. And this uh, slide that you see is that of, uh, it's, it's a real time, uh, it's a real time chart of uh, how many tsunamis are currently being tracked by our tsunami tracking system. On the left-hand side is the map, and on the right-hand side are even small tsunamis um, or that, 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 that are currently being tracked. And we wanted something similar. So let's, uh, before going to vulnerabilities, let's quickly take a look at some of the tsunami facts how they occur and how our uh, tsunami tracking system, the US tsunami tracking system is able to give us so much accurate information on them. So essentially tsunamis are caused by earthquakes, earthquakes, landslides, volcanic eruptions and things like that. But the main thing to note is that these events cannot be predicted, but we still have a, a, a fully operational tsunami warning center. So this can be compared with vulnerabilities, attacks, and threats. Today, as I speak right now, I generally don't have much, uh, much idea on what vulnerabilities will come out tomorrow, what patches will come out tomorrow, what attacks will come out tomorrow. Then how can I predict what would be the most high-profile vulnerabilities that are coming towards me? Well, let's find out. So this is a typical DART system, which is a deep ocean assessment and reporting system uh, used by the Tsunami Tracking Center. It's made of three main components. There are these sensors that are glued or um, sort of uh, attached to the ocean floor. They are held down by a bunch of anchors. What these sensors do is they record even minor tremors, uh, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, things like that, things that uh, have the potential to cause a tsunami. These, uh, and, and there are uh, many such uh, sensors uh, at the ocean floor. These sensors talk to the surface buoys uh, through various communication uh, mechanisms. There is uh, acoustic uh, telemetry that's, that's the most common. And they talk with the surface buoys and constantly give out data on what earthquakes, small or large, and um, such activities are happening at the ocean floor. The surface buoys, what they do is they collect data from these uh, small sensors which are distributed across the ocean floor. And the surface buoys have the necessary power to communicate with the satellite. The, the sensors obviously are not that high powered. They cannot directly connect to the satellite. So the surface buoys take uh, sensor data, sensory data from the ocean floor, from many of these sensors, communicate that with the satellite, which has a bi-directional communication link to the command and control center. Surface buoys also gather information on uh, various other things like uh, how fast the wind is blowing on the surface and uh, how, how big the surface and whatnot. At the, and so this is an example of one of the dark uh, surface buoys. At the uh, command and control, the, the data is compiled and a lot of algorithms applied to this data based on various, uh, well now we call it ML and AI, but uh, various algorithms and that helps the, our tsunami tracking center to communicate only the high priority tsunamis and sort of weed out all the low noise or the data that does not need to be processed. So essentially this is similar to the problem that uh, we have in the vulnerability land. There are, um, 15,000 vulnerabilities, unique vulnerabilities coming out. We need to, we need an automated system that can weed out all the noise, give us real time alerts only on the most prevalent, the most seismic vulnerabilities. So can principles from tsunami warning system be applied for cyber attacks? Well, let's 
find out. The root cause for tsunamis are earthquakes, which cannot be predicted. The root cause for uh, cyber attacks are, vulner uh, is, are vulnerabilities. Those cannot be predicted either. But still real-time alerting is possible for tsunamis based on the three different uh, parts of the system that we saw. The data collection buoys, the data point collection buoys, communication, and analytics. So let's find out if these three principles can be applied to vulnerabilities to get a tsunami-like vulnerability alerting and prioritization system that can do this automatically and in real time. So what do we need for this real-time alerting and prioritization? We need data collection. Mm, if you, uh, we just talked about a lot of sensors that are at the bottom of the ocean floor. Similarly, we need a lot of sensors to collect data on vulnerabilities. We need communication to get the data in, and then a lot of analytics uh, to weed out all the noise and only uh, give away high profile vulnerabilities. So we took uh, various different approaches. We were initially thinking about honeypots. Now, most of you know what a honeypot is. Uh, a honeypot is a, a device which is intentionally vulnerable so that uh, you have these devices exposed on the internet at various locations. You have a couple of devices in the US, a couple of devices in the UK, EU, Asia, so on and so forth. And then since you have these vulnerable devices, you wait and you see who attacks you. And what a honeypot has is it has mechanism to record all these attacks and let you know in not real, really real time, but sort of almost real time uh, on what attacks are happening, which can give you information on what's happening all over the world. We did not take this approach. One, because, uh, and, and nothing against honeypots here, but this gives you a post-exploitation view. So for a honeypot to work correctly, by definition, the vulnerability has to be out. The information on how to exploit that vulnerability has to be out. There has to be malicious actors ex actively exploiting that vulnerability. And there have to be automated uh, malicious scanners that have already been written that would compromise you. So honeypots are great. They have great utility and we use them for other purposes. But for this purpose, we decided not to go with honeypots, mostly because the, what you get, it's post-exploitation. By the time you get the data, everyone knows that this is a big deal and you, you may have been already compromised. The second way, which is other extreme of honeypots is manual tracking, analysis, reverse engineering. Now this technique is also good and we do it uh, at different places on different occasions. But again, what we wanted was uh, more of an automated system. This technique consists of getting uh, malware samples, uh, samples, uh, and, and then essentially reversing those samples, opening up those malware samples in reverse engineering tools, and then studying what the malware is trying to do and getting more information about that particular virus or worm or malware or things like that. Again, this is a great technique, but we thought it's, uh, it, it's not very applicable to what we were trying to do. So finally, what we decided was we decided to go to the open source, open source route. We decided to use public data to collect information. So our sensors were essentially public data on attacks, on exploits, on data leaks, on vulnerabilities. We also uh, made use of various vulnerability feeds like your NVD, various exploit feeds, which tell you what um, the, the relationship between a CVE and exploit. We also automatically uh, wrote sensors to collect data from various blogs and posts and even uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and things like that. So for the sake of this project, 
for real-time vulnerability analysis uh, and prioritization, we made use of all these public data sources. So the technology that we used was pretty simple. I mean, this is just something that we used and uh, I think um, one can use any similar technology uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be this. For our purposes, we used Amazon AWS. Uh, we had Lambda functions for our sensors for data collection. So we had one Lambda function to collect, for example, data from uh, NVD. We had another Lambda function to, for example, to collect data from blogs. We had another Lambda function to collect data from Twitter. So we had uh, various different serverless Lambda functions that acted as our uh, data collection, uh, data points, data collection points. We used, uh, we were thinking about a NoSQL database, but um, at that time, uh, we're most familiar with a certain variety of database. We use that. Also, uh, the data that we were um, looking at was uh, not typically the ML and AI type of data that uh, you, most people are used to these days. And I'll talk about that later. And again, for uh, data analysis, we used various Lambda functions that got triggered uh, on data on completion of data collection. So the, so the design looked something like this. On your left-hand side, there are these various data collection lambdas. Each lambda function in AWS collected data on, uh, as I mentioned, exploits, blogs, feeds, Twitter, whatnot. We got all that data into a database. And then once this data was completed, we had an, our analy analytics running to give us real-time prioritization and alerts. Now, this analytics engine was, uh, I think, the heart of uh, this project. The way it worked was we had weights assigned to a lot of uh, Lambda functions and the data coming through these Lambda functions. So essentially, uh, for some things, for, for a data source like uh, NVD or MITRE, the weight assigned was very less or almost zero. And that's because you are expecting to find all vulnerabilities on NVD or MITRE and um, similar vulnerability tracking sites. So the weight for that was very less. The weight for data collected from things like uh, exploits where you get information on exploits uh, and various exploit feed, the weightage was a little higher. The weightage given, and, and similarly, we essentially fine-tuned the weight that was given to blogs, bulletin boards, um, Twitter feeds, and a lot of these data collection lambdas. The analytics function was uh, a pretty simple uh, analytics uh, function uh, and a mathematical formula to calculate weights and then come up with a score for each vulnerability or each CVE. So on the left, what you have is you have your data collection lambda functions going into the analytics engine and a simple weight-based mechanism to calculate the um, to calculate the weight of every vulnerability or every CVE that we get. And that created our real-time uh, alerts and prior. So let's take a look on how it works. So this is a chart uh, for the first month of data that we collected. We started this about two years ago. I remember it was uh, around Christmas of 2017. We had our project almost done and we, we let it run for about a month, which was in December of 2017. Um, we, we went for holidays and when we came back in January and started analyzing the data, this is uh, what we got. On the x-axis, you have the vulnerability intelligence quotient. So these are, these are essentially the, this is essentially the weight that is calculated by the analytics engine for each vulnerability. And on the y-axis, what you have is a timeline. 
And as you can see here, the timeline is just for one month. This was just like almost like a, a test that we did and see uh, what happens with one month of data. So we got a lot of data, but we saw some outliers. So the one on the top, at the very top is what was for a CVE in the Microsoft malware production engine. And it was a remote code execution vulnerability, which actually uh, attackers can use to um, take control of your machine with the help of the malware production engine, which is uh, essentially supposed to protect you. So we said, okay, that's good. That seems like a high profile vulnerability and our system based on the output of our system it does it is on on the top the second vulnerability here in our example was a palo alto networks pan os remote code execution vulnerability again same thing uh, attacker could use the uh, remote code uh, the remote management interface for to to perform remote code execution again we thought that yeah it is a pretty high profile vulnerability we went through a lot of other vulnerabilities in there manually to make sure that what our the results from our system are good that it that generally system, uh, the system, the vulnerabilities that our researchers thought uh, were high profile are being ranked correctly as high profile by this automated system so we said okay that's a great start and decided to uh, just keep the system running. So this is uh, essentially the, these are the, the various characteristics of the Apollo Alto vulnerability or CVE. What you have here is, uh, this is a screenshot from NVD, and uh, what you have here is the CVS score for that vulnerability. The CVS score was 9.8, and as you can see, the Attack vector was network, which is bad. Complex Attack complexity was low, which is also bad. Privilege required was none. User interaction, none. So on and so forth. And we all, all again, our researchers uh, went through this manually to make sure that uh, there, is no, there is no bug in this. But what we saw about five days later, which is just in the second month of the system being online is a massive, massive jump in the vulnerability intelligence quotient for about two vulnerabilities. So as I mentioned on the Y axis, you have days. So this chart is plotted per day. And on the X axis, the vulnerability intelligence quotient. Initially, we thought that something went wrong in the system because for the last month and month and a half, we had vulnerabilities with their intelligence quotient with 500, 600, 800, something like that. And on around, uh, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, 5th of January in 2018, we had a few vulnerabilities with their weight or intelligence quotient more than 2,500, almost approaching 3,000. Can you guess what vulnerabilities these were? Well, if you, if you guessed uh, Meltdown and Spectre, then you are right, because these were, if you remember, the high profile uh, Meltdown and Spectre vulnerabilities that affected uh, a lot of um, microprocessors. And uh, there were a lot of side channel based attack vulnerabilities where essentially a process can uh, look or can uh, view data into another process and also cause remote execution. So these vulnerabilities, I think most of us here have been around for like a few years and can still remember the, the huge, huge impact that these vulnerabilities had on, on almost in the entire ecosystem, on almost all of us. Desktop systems were affected, servers were affected, um, laptops were affected. These two meltdown and spectral vulnerabilities affected all, almost all home, uh, almost all hardware. So uh, we were really again happy to see that uh, our vulnerability alerting system really gave melt, meltdown and specter uh, intelligence quotient of more than 2,500. And that was, as you can see from the graph, a very high number 
as compared to what it had given before. Now you can you see two arrows pointing to two dots there. That's because uh, these vulnerabilities were ranked uh, higher for multiple days, and the chart is drawn every day. So uh, melt a little bit information on meltdown inspector. But soon we realized that uh, the system seems to be working, but we cannot communicate the weight or the vulnerability intelligence quotient in numbers. Like the quotient for meltdown is 2,700. 2,700 watt. That's obviously it was not uh, self-explanatory. So we decided to have a system that would divide these numbers or these uh, intelligence quotients into various different threat levels, which uh, a normal uh, practitioner can understand easily and quickly. Low, elevated, high, critical. We went with uh, these four. The way these were calculated was, and again, uh, we were calculating in a particular way before. Now we are doing it differently, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. Uh, but initially, it was a simple ratio. And once you uh, put your vulnerability intelligence quotient in it, this is what the what it came out with. So so far we we had only two vulnerabilities with critical uh, rating, and like a few with medium and then low, and so on and so forth. This was something that we knew from the get go. We may need to uh, change the formula to essentially divide these intelligence quotients into high, medium, low, and critical. But still, for the first month, when we did some analysis of the data, like essentially compared our alerts with CVSS, we found this. Now again, CVSS, as you know, is the common vulnerability scoring system. And it is amazing. It has helped the, it has helped organizations for the last 20 years enormously. And we internally also use CVSS for various things. But one of the things that, uh, at least for this purpose, CVSS is not useful about is that a lot of vulnerabilities get too high of a rating. And that's because it only considers the fundamental characteristics of the vulnerabilities, the CVSS base score and does not consider characteristics like if it has been exploited in the wild or how many instances are there in the wild and so on and so forth. And that makes it really difficult to use CVSS as a prioritization mechanism. If, if you can see in the first month of data on the left-hand side, we have CVSS and then we had 96 vulnerabilities, which were the highest, which are the highest criticality between nine and 10 while our system here on the right had only four alerts, which were for two vulnerabilities, meltdown inspector, only six alerts for high vulnerabilities, and then only 20 alerts for elevated vulnerabilities. Most of the time, we uh, low is uh, vulnerabilities that have really low severity, and most of the time it's even, I mean, you could for all practical purposes, purpose of prioritization to find out what's the most critical vulnerability, ignore this. So going on, this was our one-year data. Uh, again, same thing. Uh, Y-axis has time, X-axis has intelligence quotient. This is internal data. And uh, on, on, on the left side, in, uh, December, in, in January of 2018, December of 2017, you can see this 2,500 to 3,000. These were the two spectra and the meltdown vulnerabilities that we saw. Throughout the year, there were a few vulnerabilities, but none of them touched the vulnerability intelligence quotient that was generated by spectra and meltdown. So we almost thought that this was like only a one-time thing where a vulnerability like spectra or meltdown comes out. And do we really need to uh, adjust our formula for rating these vulnerabilities into these uh, red, um, orange, yellow, and green zones? But what happened almost uh, at the end of 2018 was we did get two really high profile vulnerabilities, two or actually four high profile vulnerabilities that almost 
did go to the level of severity of uh, meltdown inspector. One of his was the lib SSH authentication bypass. And many of you may remember this is, uh, um, this was a SSH vulnerability where you attackers could connect to SSH server without providing any credentials. So for any Linux users, this was almost like a very devastating vulnerability. Um, if your server is configured in a certain configuration and so on and so forth. So there are certain nuances and details that you have to look at it. And the second vulnerability that again got a higher intelligence quotient, which was able to crack and go into that critical vulnerability bucket was the Apple Mac OS uh, kernel crash vulnerability, which was ICMP packet handling vulnerability. ICMP, as you know, is a protocol where you can, we don't, you don't need to authenticate. It's not TCP based uh, either. You can just send ICMP packets to the Mac OS or iOS kernel to essentially crash the device. So there were vulnerabilities uh, that, that cracked the critical um, criteria and we were pretty uh, excited to see that our our formula to um, to distribute this vulnerability intelligence quotient into high medium low and critical that what that was still holding true so after one year what we saw was I mean what we had set out was to get real-time vulnerability alerts and as you can see we get vulnerability alerts daily. That is because our sensors collected data daily, gave it to the analytics engine and uh, reports were generated daily. Uh, but also what you can see is that uh, during the same time period, there were about 1,500 vulnerabilities that CVSS ranked as uh, with the highest criticality. CVSS criticalities go from zero to 10. And there were 1,500 unique vulnerabilities that were ranked nine to 10. As you know, uh, triaging these uh, 1,500 vulnerabilities times uh, the number of malware that is, uses them to exploit times the number of machines that you have gets, the numbers become quick very fast. While in our system, what we had for the same time period was only nine vulnerabilities were marked as critical, 35 were marked as high, and 184 were marked as elevated. So as far as prioritization is concerned, I think, uh, I mean, we were pretty happy with the results that we got. Moving along, um, I, I talked about um, basically fine tuning the algorithm for uh, for dividing these vulnerabilities into low, high, medium, and critical. Again, in this chart, if you observe closely on the left-hand side, you would still see these straight dots which correspond to uh, Spectre and Meltdown. Then almost in the center of the chart, you see some vulnerabilities that we just saw, the Apple iOS and the SSH vulnerability. And uh, in mid-2019, we again got a pretty big spike of vulnerabilities that were able to crack into the critical uh, section. These were the Microsoft uh, Blue Keep RDP remote code execution vulnerability and the WhatsApp uh, remote code execution issue. As you may remember, for Blue Keep, Microsoft mentioned that uh, their telemetry showed that there were about 400,000 endpoints on the internet that uh, their telemetry found were. Uh, were open or were susceptible to these vulnerabilities. So it had a potential to be at the next uh, WannaCry or such vulnerabilities which had millions of dollars um, attached to it because of exploitation. Um, so what we thought was instead of having, um, what we thought of was uh, making this uh, alerting mechanism or this classification mechanism a little bit more dynamic and the way it behaves now is that it takes uh, it, it stamps the vulnerabilities with uh, high low medium critical but the the numbers change so as you can see 
here the Microsoft Blue Key uh, remote code execution vulnerability has the internal threat intelligence quotient of uh, uh, about 3,700, which was a lot more than the Spectre or Meltdown. But also, Spectre and Meltdown affected everyone different operating systems, uh, Windows, Linux, um, various different devices. Whereas the Blue Keep, although it affected 400,000 devices on the internet, it was a Microsoft RDP remote code execution vulnerability, not a hardware-based vulnerability. So what we concluded was that now, not that uh, RD, um, Blue Keep was any more critical than Spectre or Spectre was any less critical than Blue Keep, but this was attributed just that there is a lot more data being collected by our sensors now. And that is a direct result of a lot, uh, a lot more data being generated for these vulnerabilities. So we realized that we need sort of uh, a sliding scale, an algorithm that would slowly change, slowly change as we collect more and more data. I'm sure one year from now, as we are collecting more and more data and more and more open source data is available, uh, there would be a lot more vulnerabilities that would fall into the urgent or critical section. So now we have changed, uh, changed the algorithm to uh, compensate that. Again, a very familiar chart comparison between CVSS and uh, our data. If, uh, if you look at CVSS, there were, um, again, thousands of alerts, uh, while as compared to the system that we built, there were only 15 alerts. It is a lot more easier to respond to 15 or 54 high-profile prof uh, alerts as compared to responding to thousands and thousands of alerts. So this is the last ch chart about data. This is all the data that we have from about uh, two and a half years. As you can see, again, on the left-hand side, you still see Spectre and Meltdown, but they are now, they look a little bit short or tiny as compared to the data that we are collecting now. This is what happens when uh, we sort of uh, distribute the data between high, medium, low, and critical. The highest that we have so far is the NSA curveball vulnerability. And um, I, I'm sure most of you still have, uh, have, have uh, injuries from that, that curveball. Uh, as you know, this uh, vulnerability was a curveball because it was a vulnerability in the PKI infrastructure in the Mm, elliptical curve, and that's why the name curveball, in the elliptical curve algorithm that is used to sign certificates. Essentially, what, uh, what happened was that, and what could have happened, or what the vulnerability was, that an attacker could sign files, sign website certificates, so that any malicious website could also be reported to the browser or to you as a trusted website. And this vulnerable, in, in, in the words of Neil, who is, um, who is technical director of NAC, NAC cybersecurity, this kind of vulnerability may shake our belief in the strength of cryptography cryptographic authentication mechanisms and make us question if we really can rely on them. Fortunately, we can. So he had to come out and sort of uh, give a word of confidence that there is no, uh, no deficiency in the cryptographic algorithms. It's essentially a weakness in the implementation and then blah, blah, blah. There, were, um, there was a lot of explanation about this vulnerability where uh, if it, if a certain type of elliptical curve is used in generation of the certificates, then one can create a spoof certificate, which uh, when validated can, can essentially pass validation. So overall, as you can see now, the um, NSA uh, curveball vulnerability falls into critical. It has a lot higher vulnerability intelligence quotient as compared to meltdown and spectre 
but we have not changed the criticality on meltdown inspector even though by today's standard by today's standard meltdown inspector would be not critical in our algorithm they they are as you can see they are falling into the orange or the second uh, second high category but what we decided was once we stamp a vulnerability we as high critical medium low these vulnerabilities are stamped as such based on the standard on which they were uh, reported by the alerting system so we will still keep meltdown inspector as critical but going forward as this algorithm changes uh, as more and more to compensate uh, because we have more and more data being collected constantly so overall takeaways if you uh, if you need like only one slide to take home from this session that would be this which is the list of top 10 vulnerabilities in the last two two and a half years that our uh, real-time vulnerability system was able to identify prioritize and generate uh, alerts on um, there are various vulnerabilities here i'm not going to go over each of them and some of them we already talked about in uh, uh, during this session so so where are we and where are we going what where are we going to take this project? How can you get your hands on this data and on these alerts and on, um, on, on, on this vulnerability prioritization scheme? So one of the first thing that we are doing right now is, uh, is implementing a system which would allow you to have uh, free access uh, community to uh, the entire community to have free access to data as well as to the alerts that it generates so that's the first priority of the current work that is happening in the future we also plan to do different type of trendings as in we are thinking about a classification different types of classification so that you could set filters that i only want to be alerted on web application vulnerabilities or cloud vulnerability server vulnerabilities or appliance vulnerabilities on and so forth so these this classification would allow users to get vulner top vulnerabilities only from their domain uh, the second thing that we are looking at is uh, having uh, at attack and exploit classification. So adding more information to see how we can attach uh, ransomware data, targeted attacks data, malware data to these vulnerabilities to, again, uh, future expose and enrich the experience that, uh, that, that one would have. As well as, uh, last but not least, is the root cause classification to classify what was what is the root cause for all these vulnerabilities lastly we are also uh, trying to apply various uh, ml and ai type of uh, algorithms and different type of data collection um, which is more suited for machine learning it, it, it could be that uh, nowadays you have algorithms that can read blogs give blogs give you information on what the blog is about and if it is uh, in uh, it is a positive blog or it's a negative blog so more sort of automation of uh, public data all right so all in all that's uh, the real time vulnerability tracking and prioritization system that we developed if you have any questions uh, please feel free to reach out to me my twitter handle is here uh, on the screen and i hope you enjoyed the session thank you